the anatomy of the pineal gland. Um, why? Well, um, a couple of months ago, I talked about how light affects our circadian rhythm uh, and how then light can affect our sleep uh, through the pineal gland, and that piqued my anatomical interest. I wanted to look at it in more detail, which I have done and I will do now. For most medical students, it is a mm, sentence, maybe two sentences in a textbook that you need to know about, but there's quite a lot of interesting stuff here. Oh, well, I found it interesting anyway. Even if nobody watches this video, it has already been useful to me. Here it is. Um, or I can also pop, pop yours out. This is, it's a little bit more 3D, this one. And that's the pineal gland there. Um, pineal, because it's uh, pine cone shaped. Uh, it's a single structure in the midline. It is a gland, it produces hormones, so it's an endocrine organ, and it produces hormones that will pass into the blood and probably into the cerebrospinal fluid as well and act on uh, tissues and structures at a distance. Um, that mentioned, uh, you know about the blood-brain barrier? So the blood-brain barrier, if you take an animal, sorry, if back in the day you took an animal and you injected its blood with dye, that dye would then pass to all the tissues of the body, but not the brain. So the small molecule of the dye will pass through the leaky capillaries, the fenestrated capillaries, capillaries that we see in most of the tissues of the body and dye the tissues of the body, but not so the brain, and that is because of the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a microscopic structure. The endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, the capillaries inside the brain, are tightly stuck together by tight junctions and wrapped around with podocytes, um, so they are sealed. They are not leaky. They are not fenestrated, which means that only very small molecules can diffuse across or molecules have to be actively transported across from the blood to the brain. This is why it's difficult to get drugs to the brain. You have to kind of mimic some of those other molecules. Anyway, the blood-brain barrier, pineal gland, doesn't have one. Um, and that is, uh, well, it's pretty important if you're an endocrine organ because you want to be able to put your hormones into the blood. Now, the hormone that we know about, uh, melatonin, and you might take melatonin if you have jet lag or you expect to have jet lag to help you sleep when you move to a different time zone where the day and light cycle is different to the day and light cycle in the place that you left. Anyway, we'll come back to that. Melatonin is the hormone that we know about, which affects the circadian clock. But the pineal gland also seems to have an effect on the pituitary gland, which in turn has an effect on other organs of the body, and some of this is not entirely understood. Um, the pineal gland is also called the epiphysis cerebri, which I don't really like. Epiphysis, you also have an epiphysis in your, in your long bones. Epiphysis cerebri. It also gets called the pineal body, okay. So pineal gland, yes it is a gland, pineal body is fine. And it is part of something called the epithalamus. Uh, the ep so the thalamus is this bulge here. There is a left and right thalamus, so we're between the two thalami here. The thalamus, is a collection of nuclei, a, a whole load of neurons that, well, acts as a sensory relay for all the sensory information coming into your body, except smell. And it has a whole bunch of other roles as well. So, um, the, you know, we're, we're talking about the, the physical location here. Epithalamus means upon the thalamus. So there are a bunch of structures here upon the thalamus. The pineal gland gets lumped into that, that group of structures there. Um, epithalamus, pineal body, pineal gland, epiphysis cerebri. And we can add more detail. So here is the midbrain. Um, if the pineal gland is a single midline structure and there's a left and right thalamus, then the pineal gland is sitting between the two thalami um, at its posterior end there. In the midbrain, we have a couple of bumps back here. These are the colliculi the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. We have left and right ones of those as well. You add them all together, you've got the corpora quadrigeminus. You might hear that term banded around here. But the pineal body is sat just on top of the superior colliculi and kind of like just, just in between them. It's sat nestled into the middle 
of the two, period, two superior colliculi. And there is a space between the two thalami, which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid in life, CSF. That space is the third ventricle. So the pineal gland is at the posterior end of the third ventricle. Uh, the pineal gland has a pineal stalk. Uh, we, oh, we, can, we can see it, but the pineal stalk is it's split like that. So the, the, the V-shape, like the recess it makes, is called the pineal recess. That's the shape that the pineal stalk, kind of the two legs of the pineal stalk, is making in the, uh, in the posterior end of the third ventricle. Now, that, <laughs> that pineal stalk is where we start to get into the weeds. Um, so the lower part of the pineal stalk is the posterior commissure. Um, you know how uh, the pupillary light reflex, if you shine light into one eye, both pupils constrict. So the light is, it's the posterior commissure that's linking both sides of the body there to cause both pupils to respond to light just going into one side. Posterior commissure, it's, the commissure is a white matter tract linking both sides of the brain here. And then the superior leg of the stalk is the um, habenula commissure. The habenula, the habenula nuclei are just anterior to the pineal gland. The habenula nuclei are involved, well, they're involved, they're, they're part of the limbic systems. So they're involved in emotion and memory and learning, um, in probably um, reward processes. Um, and that's, you know, limbic system stuff, right? And this pink thing up here, this pink bit, which in retrospect, I've been wondering what the heck that is for years and so have the students. That is bringing information to the habenula nuclei. Uh, this is the fornix, this is the corpus callosum, that's the septum pellucidum. Uh, so like when students ask me what these things are, blah, 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 oh, and then we can, us we can usually see um, the choroid plexus of the third ventricle in there, which we can't on that one. Though on this, um, this model here, um, there's the pineal gland, there's the um, pineal stalk. So that superior leg, the first part of that is the habenula uh, commissure. And as it curls over the top there, over around the, um, the thalamus, that is the stria medullaris, and that is the white matter tract bringing information to the habenula nuclei that are anterior to the pineal gland. Habenula means reins. Can you imagine how, if you've got two of these, they look like reins and the, of a horse and the thing and the imagination, come on. Um, so if that's the stria medullaris, that's the choroid plexus, that's the fornix, that's the septum pellucidum, that's the uh, corpus callosum. Ta-da! Um, so what we've got in the pineal gland is we've got pinealocytes, which are modified neurons that produce and release those hormones. We have glial cells in there, and we have astrocytes in there, so support cells. Um, but the pineal gland is innervated. It receives sympathetic innervation and parasympathetic innervation, and the trigeminal nerve seems to send some fibers in there, not entirely sure why. So parasympathetic neurons from the otic ganglion and the pterygopalatine ganglion go to the pineal gland. Um, but sympathetic neurons from the superior cervical ganglion enter here. And if you think about that pathway, that's kind of a bit weird. You have the hypothalamus, you have a descending tract in the spinal cord, preganglionic sympathetic neurons coming out the spinal cord, going up to the superior cervical ganglion, post anyway, you get the idea, right? Running all the way back up here. My point is, sympathetic innovation is required for the pineal gland to release melatonin. If the sympathetic nervous system is injured, the pineal gland does not function normally. Isn't that interesting? So it's, 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 it's like a modulator. It receives action potentials. It receives nervous input innovation impulses. Uh, so neuron inputs can be converted into endocrine outputs, the release of hormones that act at a distance and act on cells that have a receptor for melatonin. Blood supply? Well, um, we're here. So if you know your circle of Willis, um, the... Uh, 
posterior cerebral arteries are coming around here and the posterior cerebral arteries will give off posterior choroidal arteries and supply blood to those capillary networks of the pineal gland those ones without that blood-brain barrier. Venous drainage, um, well, the great cerebral vein is running nearby. Uh, that's the vein of Galen. So the great cerebral vein will drain blood from the pineal gland and take that back to the, the straight sinus and, and so on. I have read, uh, I guess in animal studies that, so melatonin is the hormone that's being released, right? I have read that not only is that hormone released into the blood, but it also does get into the cerebrospinal fluid of the third ventricle. Um, so melatonin then. Melatonin is released by the pineal gland and the amount that's released is related to the levels of light and how those change during the day. Um, so that as it gets darker, melatonin levels increase, secreted by the pineal gland, and you get sleepy and you fall asleep. And in the middle of the night, when you're in a deep sleep, that's when your melatonin levels are at their highest. And then they start to drop off again. And when melatonin levels drop down, you wake up, and then they, they're low during the day when there's a lot of light. Um, this then also means that animals can adapt to the changing length of the day, which can be, can be important for reproduction, feeding, and all sorts of other functions. Uh, in humans, uh, less so, and also we've mucked that up with uh, indoor lights and stuff anyway, right? Um, so that's the melatonin, which is the m most well-known function for the pineal gland. Um, and um, I talked about how light affects secretion in that other video, but essentially you have a specific uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells in the retina that capture that light, um, send it to a suprachiasmatic nucleus in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then sends those impulses through the sympathetic nervous system to the, uh, the pineal gland. The pineal gland does seem to have effects on other organs like the pituitary which we're missing from here um, and the gonads. Um, there are uh, quite a few papers from the 60s and the 70s where for example if you take the pineal gland out of um, uh, rats, mice, hamsters um, then the, 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 the amount of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone in the pituitary gland increases this and this is link this has led to links between um, the pineal gland and managing the onset of puberty to the right time things like that um, but the other interesting fact that medics love about the pineal gland is that over time um, most people's pineal glands become calcified uh, so not in children as a rule uh, but as you get older by the age of 30 i think 70 percent of people's pineal glands have got calcified deposits in them this gets called <laughs> brain sand uh, the reason medics love it is because when you're then looking at this region with x-rays it lights up beautifully just like bone lights up beautifully i've got one to show you Look at this, um, you can see the level we're at here. Um, so this brain sand also gets corpora, ar corpora aranacea, something like that, something really awkward to say. Um, but it me makes it a good landmark because if you see something lighten up in the middle of um, a transverse section of the brain, you've found the pineal gland. And if you know the pineal gland is at the posterior end of the third ventricle, and look, you can just about see parts of the lateral ventricles, which we also talked about the other week. You can, you can see where you are, right? Um, so this production of calcium and phosphate, possibly hydroxy, hydroxy appetite as a result. This seems to be a result of the cells producing melatonin for a long period of time. Um, does it cause problems? Maybe. Um, is there much we can do about it? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but like I say, medics love it because you look at a CT, bam. <laughs> So look, likewise, if I grab my big head slice model, whoomph, and we slice our way down, there's the lateral ventricles, Whoa, lateral ventricles, there's the thalamus there, basal ganglia, but we can't quite see the third ventricle yet, so we're not low enough. Oh, slice down, say another centimetres, that's quite a big thick slice, bam, there we are, look at that, there's a midline, single central structure there at the posterior end of the third ventricle. I wonder what that is.
is the pineal gland. Um, so thalamus, thalamus, and um, we can see bits of the lateral ventricles there. The brain is tricky because it's hard, isn't it, to uh, figure out where everything is when you can't just peel it apart and look at different layers like you can the rest of the body. The brain's too soft for that. There we go. A deep dive into the anatomy of the pineal gland, just because I do that sometimes because I'm really interested and I want to know everything. Um, and that is more than, uh, say, most medical students and healthcare professionals will need to know. But if you are working in this area, if you have a particular interest in this area, I hope that was useful. And if you don't, I hope it was um, interesting. All right. Uh, see you next week.